everybody. I'm Donna. And I wanted to bring this video to you because I was talking with one of my cousins last night. Tammy, hey, if you're watching. Um, she's getting me concerned because she's starting up this garden and for everything that she's putting in, if I'm not careful, she's going to have one bigger than mine. She has lots of things set out and I'm tickled to see her wanting to plant all this stuff. But anyways, good for you, Tammy. Um, I, I came up with the topic last night explaining to her how you do companion planting, which means you interplant things that work well together. Not all plants do work well together because some plants will bring in insects, attract them, that can be harmful to certain plants. So you don't want to put all your, you don't want to just willy-nilly put all of your plants together because you might end up attracting an insect that's just going to munch down on something you don't want, you know, eaten. So anyways, um, I thought I would bring this video to explain a little bit, just a little bit of what companion planting is. Because right now is the time where we're all setting out our gardens or whether it's a big garden, a little garden, in-ground garden, or raised bed garden, or even patio gardening putting out pots with things on the deck. You want to make sure that you get the best yield possible so you don't want to plant bad plants um, that's going to bring in something that's going to eat up your, your vegetables that you want. So there's good plantings and bad plantings. Everything does not work well together. Now you can research, Google, whatever. There's so many lists out there and they don't always agree with each other. I have several lists um, that I've uh, printed over the years. They're probably not all inclusive, but for the most part, like here I've got two different um Printouts that I have used over the years, um, but they don't always agree. One list will tell you plant this with this, and one list will say no, those don't work good together. So you have to do some research and a lot of trial and error, but you can um, get you a list of things as a guideline. Now, the list that I work with. I have found problems with certain things, and I found some of the list works well together. But what I did, just to bring you some examples, in case you're not aware, in case you are one of those gardeners who just wasn't aware. For years and years and years and years and years, I was not aware. And I just planted things where they seemed like they would fit good together um, physically. I was not aware that certain things just don't play well together. Just like people and animals, all things don't play well together. But just so this video is not too long, I've got a short list of examples that I wanted to share with you. Because right now is the time that we're all putting out stuff in our garden. and We don't want to uh, go to all that trouble of planting something only to find out that this thing you've got next to this thing is not going to work well together and you're not going to want to dig it up, but you're also not going to have a very good yield. So, my examples to you, and I encourage you to do some research, gather as much information as you can because it is very confusing. Um, it took, I, I still don't know all of it, it, but it took me a long time to get just some of it in my mind. But the list is so extensive, there's no way for, for me personally to be able to remember. So I use worksheets, and I put these in my what I call my garden Bible from year to year, and, and I refer back to them when I'm planting. When I'm doing my garden, I actually draw out my garden every year, and I decide where I'm going to put things based on this list and my past experience because you also want to rotate your stuff as much as possible. Sometimes you can't because of lack of space. I have that problem right now because I'm running out of space to put things so 
there are things that's going to be planted this year in the same spot against the rules. But, hey, you do what you got to do, and you hope for the best. But if you can go into your gardening season armed with a little bit of information, it might help you um, have a more successful garden. And like I said, the list is too extensive. I cannot remember all of them. So I printed things off and I'm just going to read them to you because I can't retain all of the information. But some examples for those that are going to be planting green beans. You have companion plants of carrots, radishes, cucumbers. The carrots and green beans are supposed to be good companions because they have different nutrient requirements and they don't compete with, with each other for the nutrients in the soil. Radishes help deter bean beetles, which can be a problem for green beans, so they help ward those off. Cucumbers are another good companion for green beans because they help shade the soil and help it to retain moisture. Green beans don't necessarily help the cucumbers, but the cucumbers are supposed to help the green beans. Things you do not want to plant near your green beans, that is onions and garlic, is said that they will stunt the growth of your green beans. Sunflowers can attract aphids, which can be a problem for the green beans. Pole beans and bush beans should not be planted near each other because they can cross-pollinate and reduce your yield. For tomatoes, I picked uh, one, two, three, four, five of what I feel like are the most common things that people will put in their garden. Um, Almost everybody who grows anything are going to have these items. So I've just narrowed it down to these, what did I say, four or five? For tomatoes, planting basil near your tomatoes or under your tomatoes helps to repel pest and is said to improve the flavor of your tomatoes. Carrots can improve the soil quality and attract the beneficial insects. However, one thing to note about carrots, carrots don't do well in the heat. You know, when, when our spring and summer start getting really hot, they don't do well. They are a cool weather um, item, so you're probably not going to have a lot of luck, um, at least in our zone here, 8, zone 8, 8A to be specific, um, the southeast North Carolina coastline. Carrots are pretty much done for. It's hard to get them to grow when it starts getting really hot. I generally save my carrots for the fall and let them go through the winter. They do really well and, and hold up that way. Or plant them real early so that you're done with them before they start. the weather starts getting hot here. Um, spinach. Spinach provides shade and cools the soil, improving the tomato growth. Marigolds help repel a lot of harmful insects and nematodes. Marigolds are very, um, how do I describe it? They're beautiful flowers, but they stink. They absolutely stink. I hate touching them because they stink so bad. And that is one reason they repel a lot of the harmful insects. Nasturtiums. They trap aphids and attract beneficial insects. The things you don't want to plant near your tomatoes are brassicas, which include broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, your kales, your um, you know big leafy greens like that, because they attract the same pests and diseases as tomatoes do. So you could end up with a double whammy of insects and diseases on your tomatoes. Things from the nightshade group, which include eggplant and uh, potatoes, they too attract the same pests and diseases as tomatoes. So you don't want you don't want two plants together that's going to attract the same bad stuff, or you'll have a double dose of it. Fennel. 
which I've never grown, but it can inhibit tomato growth and flavor. Corn, you don't want to plant near your tomatoes because they attract pests and it's the pest that will feed on your tomato plants. Peppers, if you're gonna grow uh, peppers, your companion plants for peppers are basil, marjoram, oregano, rosemary, thyme, tomatoes. Those are companions. Basil will repel pests and improve the flavor. Marjoram repels pest and improves growth and flavor. Oregano does the same thing with the pest and the flavor. Rosemary, same thing. Thyme, same thing. Tomatoes and peppers are supposed to work well together. They're both in the nightshade family and they have similar growing requirements that makes them good companions. Plants that you should not plant with peppers are brassicas, the broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, etc. They compete for nutrients and they can stunt your pepper growth. Fennel produces chemicals that can inhibit pepper growth. Nightshades like potatoes and eggplant, they are susceptible to the same pests and diseases as peppers. So you don't want two plants together that have the same uh, pests and diseases or you're gonna have a double whammy. Onions and garlic can stunt pepper growth. My next item that I feel like is a common thing that we all like to grow are squash. Companions for squash are beans. And that's because beans provide nitrogen to the soil, which can help the growth of your squash. Nasturtiums, they are a natural insect repellent, helps to keep the pest away from your squash plants. And we all know, anybody who's grown squash, it's a big battle with pest on squash. Marigolds have a strong odor that can help deter pests from squash plants. Anything that can help repel pests <clears throat> on squash plants is a plus. Radishes help improve the texture and fertility of the soil around the squash plants. Things you do not want to plant with squash are your brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kales, um, because they're heavy feeders and they compete for nutrients in the soil. So when something competes for nutrients, you're going to have two items who have a reduced yield and they're going to grow, you know, very skanky and the growth can be stunted. Melons. Squash and melons are in the same family and attract the same pests and diseases, so you don't want those near each other. Because if your squash is doing well, but your melons are, you know, having a problem, you don't want that to become a problem with your squash. Potatoes and squash are both susceptible to the same soil-borne diseases, the different wilts. So you don't want to put your potatoes and squash together or near each other. And fennel can inhibit the growth of squash and should not be planted uh, with your squash. For cucumbers, beans are a good companion plant because they fix nitrogen in the soil and that's beneficial to your cucumber growth. Corn, corn can provide shade for your cucumbers and help keep the soil cool and moist. Peas, like beans, peas fix nitrogen in the soil and that's beneficial to your cucumbers. Radishes help repel cucumber beetles, and help keep the soil loose. Things to avoid with your cucumbers are any aromatic herbs. Because cucumbers are sensitive to aromatic herbs like sage, rosemary, sage and rosemary, because it will stunt their growth. Potatoes, uh, both cucumbers and potatoes are susceptible to blight and other fungal diseases, so it's best to keep them separate. Melons and cucumbers are from the same family and planting them together increases the risk of cross-pollination 
which re will result in bitter tasting fruit. Tomatoes and cucumbers are both susceptible to similar diseases like blight and powdery mildew, so it's best to avoid planting them together. So those are just a few examples of things that can and uh, should not be planted together. And I thought I would bring that to your attention if you weren't aware. Now, there is an app. Well, there's a lot of apps that you can check out and download for app that I keep on my phone and I use it. It's not perfect, but what it does do is called Sewing Calendar download it from uh, Google Play, but it has a list. Uh, it has a list of your vegetables and fruits. When you click on the list, any, any item, I'm looking for, let's look for tomatoes. There we go. Click on the tomatoes and the the app gives you all kinds of things you know times to sow the seeds times to set them out and plant them directly in the ground but it also gives you companion plants and enemies to those plants for example the app says the enemies to tomatoes are anything in the brassica family corn dill fennel, potatoes, radish, turnip, beans, mustard, and strawberry. Now, what I gave you is not an all-inclusive list. It was an example. I do wish that my example had had dill on there. you got to be careful where you plant dill because um, in spite of the fact that I can't remember what plant it was, one of my lists said dill was good for it, and I planted the dill near it, Dill attracts the swallowtail, which lays eggs, which turns into worms, and those worms decimated everything I had nearby. I kind of like to put dill off to the side somewhere, grow it just so um, I have the dill for my homemade uh, pickles. But um, you got to be careful where you put dill. You need to research things that are going to attract the tomato hornworm because those things, they're big, they're ugly, they're nasty, they're gross, but they will decimate your tomato crop. So research, pull together the information as best you can because it's really confusing. And um, trial and error because like I said all the list I've got this this is one list from one source and I don't know where I got it from I've had it for years and then this is another pretty thick list um, this doesn't say where I got that from either the two lists are not the same they they have similar information but they kind of contradict each other as well. Um, I have planted things for years and found things that worked well, so I stick with that, and I really wish I could give you examples off the top of my head, but I can't. Um, one thing I do know is the year before last, I didn't pay attention, and I planted my cucumbers in the same box almost next to each other but they were spread out enough so that I you know my, my cucumbers grew big and or they grew wide and so did the it was cantaloupe that's what it was they they grew well but what they didn't do was produce very much fruit and everything should have been perfect like you know the soil was good, um, they were watered properly, fertilized properly, but they just, neither of those two produced very well. Across the way from that particular garden box, I had others, but they were, one was planted at the end of this box and one was planted down there from the same seed batch. And those plants did really, really well. They were prolific and I had lots of fruit, lots of um 
uh, cantaloupe on the one plant and lots of cucumbers on the other. But the box where the two were planted very close to each other, not much at all. One or two, and then the plants started dying out. I couldn't find a reason other than I broke the rule. They were planted too close together. What they did end up getting, both of them, was powdery mildew, which ultimately destroyed the plants. So that was trial and error. Because I couldn't find any other reason, in my mind, that must have been the problem because the ones across the way did super well. So anyways, um, I'm going to conclude this video. I just thought I would bring it to your attention for my friends and family who um, occasionally maybe watch my videos who are maybe getting out some uh, stuff they're planting for their garden, um, maybe for the first time. And I thought that this would be helpful because this is something that gardeners who do not garden year after year after year might not be aware of. And I thought that it might be helpful to bring the subject up. There's no way that I can give you a complete list of what works well together and what does not. But it would be in your interest to research and get some kind of guideline so that the money you've spent on your, your seeds, your soil, your garden, your pots, uh, your excitement, your anticipation, and hopes and dreams of, you know, growing well, hopefully, you know, by adhering to some small rules, you can increase your harvest by not allowing things to be planted wrongly together and attract pests and diseases because it's heartbreaking and it's expensive. So anyways, I hope it was helpful. I hope all of y'all have a great day and I'll talk to you later.